So 1 Samuel 18, we're going to be working out of that today, starting in verse 5 and going all the way to the end of it, believe it or not. Now, as you're turning there, I want to take a couple of moments this morning to explain the title of the sermon, Heart POV, that I used this week. If I were to show you the acronym POV, what does that mean to you? Point of view, point of view. Did I hear something different over here? Huh? Oh. oh so it, it can actually mean a lot of different things, right? I mean, I mean, if you work at the DMV, a POV is a privately owned vehicle, right? So anyway, that's not what we're, we're going to use today. When you go to the dictionary, most of them agree with you that in today's world, in the social, uh, social media world, it means point of view. And that's how we're going to use it today. It's not a new acronym. Uh, this is something I discovered. You know, it was first used about 300 years ago, before we were even a nation. Point of view was put out, down as POV. Now, to use it effectively, you have to take some things into account. Obviously, context is important when considering someone's perspective on a subject or something. Okay, if you, if you go in the DMV and they say, are you here to register your POV? It doesn't mean they want you to type out your point of view so they can put it on their website. So we have to remember that. That's half of the title, the second half. Now, if you really want someone's point of view on something, right? If you really want to know where they're coming from, you also have to consider some other things. You have to consider their mental mindset. Mentally, uh, what do they know? What do they remember? What do they understand? What can they relate to? Also, their emotions. Which emotions have a tendency to control their reactions. And typically, those reactions are based on experiences. So we have the mental aspect, the emotional aspect, but there's also the spiritual aspect. Who they're spiritually focused on. Who they believe controls their life. And that almost always boils down to either self or their sovereign God. Now, you may recall last month, if you were here for our sermon called Heart Exam, uh, we looked at those three innermost parts of a man, and we called them our heart, which refers to the center of an individual's emotional, mental, and spiritual life. It's the deepest part of a man and it reflects who they really are. So, if you're seeking, or if, if anyone's seeking your heart's point of view, your heart's POV on something, it's like me saying, hey, you know what? In your heart of hearts, how do you really feel? But there's a catch here. Because we're taught... You guys all know this. We're taught from a very early age how to mask the, or even monitor the behavior of our real me or your real heart. But occasionally, right, the real me works its way to the surface for all to see. And when that happens, we might find ourselves saying things like, did I say that out loud? Or did I really do that? I'll give you an example. I remember one time when I was 16 and a new driver. I think I'd only been driving like maybe three months. By the way, for all you new drivers that can't drive with your buddies in your car for a while, I'm part of the reason for that law. <laughs> and that's what was going on. Okay, three of my buddies were in the car with me and we were driving home from the beach that day and we're on the freeway and we're driving in my family's old American Motors 
Rambler. It was a four-door. Remember those? Look, Kathy found a picture. I, for a moment, I thought that was the car right there, but the, the paint was more of an avocado green. And man, let me tell you, that was a real magnet right there for getting dates. <laughs> Probably why I never had a date until I was a senior. <laughs> anyway, um, so the shocks were really, really bad on this car. And so here we are, we're driving back, and you know, with my vast driving experience behind the wheel and my incredible knowledge of traffic laws, I decide, I decide that I want to get back at my buddies for something. I'll tell you in just a second. So I want to make them sick, and I'm going to do it by weaving back and forth in that car on the freeway going 55. I was 16. My brain was not fully developed yet. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get these guys car sick, all right? Um, and so, so the real me was thinking that. I want to get back, not thinking of anyone else on the road, right? Just me. And I thought it oh, this will be a fun way to get their attention. And I did get some attention from the California Highway Patrol. <clears throat> and this, the traffic stop did not go well, but that's a story for another day. It, it was pretty scary. But here's what I want to point out here. Isn't it amazing how fear, embarrassment, in my case that day, a hefty fine, and a fix-it ticket will cause you to start to monitor your behavior in the future. It's very effective at doing that. Because you see, in my heart, the real me wanted to get back at my buddies because these were the guys that earlier that day had shamed me into trying to body surf this big, huge wave that almost killed me. It was pretty bad. And so that incident's still fresh in my mind. It's, it's still right there in my heart, right? And I want to get back at him. And it reared its ugly head. And even today, even as I was writing this earlier in the week, I find myself, myself thinking, did I really do that? <clears throat> but unfortunately, that happens to us, doesn't it? <clears throat> no matter how hard you work, to monitor or modify your outward behavior, there seems to come a time when unresolved issues stirring around in your heart, the innermost real you, bubble up to the surface in the things you say or do. And when that happens, others see you from your heart's point of view. And so I titled the sermon Hearts POV because I believe we will see that in our verses today. I know we see it in our verses today. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, we all know that we have an old nature inside of us. The Bible makes that very clear. But as Christians, as Christ followers, we also have your indwelling Holy Spirit living inside us, uh, working to change us, to transform us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it does so working alongside the guidance we get from your Word. Father, we're going into your Word now today, and we need your Word. And we need to see how your Word points us to Jesus Christ. May it be so this morning as we study these incidents in 1 Samuel 18. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me just a moment, if you don't mind. Ah, refreshing, purified water. <laughs> Over the last two weeks, we've seen a young shepherd boy with a heart after God's own named David defeat a giant of a man named Goliath. That event, along with the events uh, after the battle, exposed the real hearts of several others through their behavior. 
So we did witness Goliath's heart. Goliath and the Philistine people had a deep-seated hatred for God. And for, well, for, and God's people. You're going to have to work with me as I struggle through today, okay? So they have a deep-seated hatred, not just for God's people, but God also. And they wanted to make slaves of them. So Goliath's heart reveals a worldly perspective or a worldly point of view. Worldly meaning the, the world that's temporarily controlled by Satan. We also see David's heart. God had sent David to provide salvation for his people. David recognized God's purpose for him and longed to fulfill the will of God in his life. Through David's heart, we see a godly perspective. Not that he's perfect or sinless, by the way, but he does have a godly view of things. He sees things through God's eyes. We also have seen Saul's heart. Saul has recognized David's value to him. To him. Unlike David, who has a heart after God's own, Saul has a heart for self. And having received a glimpse of this young man's faith, Saul's heart would also see David as a possible threat to his throne. So he decides initially, right, to keep him close so he can keep his eyes on him. Saul's heart operates from a selfish perspective. And by the way, Saul appears to be doing a good job of monitoring the behavior of his selfish heart at this point, and in public. Now we know from chapter 13 and 15 that God and the prophet Samuel have seen his selfishness, but not the people of Israel. And then last week in, in our verses, Spence introduced us to Jonathan's heart. Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan was the son of King Saul, He's next in line for the throne. So he's not only the crown prince, but you know, he's also a valiant warrior himself. He also saw David's strong faith in action that day, but he had a heart of faith that far exceeded his father's. Jonathan realized he had found a kindred spirit in David. And Jonathan's heart presents a humble, selfless perspective. Now these two, Jonathan and David, would form a very close covenantal relationship and spend the rest of their lives looking out for the best interest of each other. Jonathan has given his princely garments and weapons to David in recognition of the obvious heir to his father's throne. And there's no doubt in my mind, Jonathan's generous gifts that day led to David's successes. So let's start reading about those in 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. David marched out with the army and was successful in everything Saul sent him to do. Saul put him in command of the fighting men. Notice we're not given a number here. Which pleased all the people and Saul's servants as well. Even the servants are thrilled about this. As the troops were coming back, when David was returning from killing the Philistine, the women came out from all the cities of Israel to meet King Saul singing and dancing with tambourines, with shouts of joy, and with three-stringed instruments. <clears throat> Here's a little news flash for you. David is certainly no longer an unknown shepherd boy. The people have seen him in action, and they are excited. And there's a lot to be excited about in the kingdom these days. Their king obviously has an eye for picking the right soldier to promote into leadership. 
always important for our country's leaders. The army has been successful against their strongest enemies, and the long-term threat of becoming slaves to the Philistines is gone for now. They are joyful and pleased with both their king and David. They're so excited that they break out in song to honor both of them. And here's their little ditty. As they danced, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. So it certainly appears as though everyone in Israel, remember even Saul's servants, they were excited and they were attracted to this young shepherd boy who dared to face Goliath, uh, take on the Philistines, and carry out the orders of their king. They admired David's great faith, his courage, his skill as a warrior. But not everyone listening that day enjoyed these ladies' choice of lyrics. Which makes you wonder, contextually speaking, just what are they singing? I found this commentary, actually D helped me find this, uh, on 1 Samuel, where pastor and Christian author John Woodhouse has this to say about that verse or about that little song that the ladies just sang. He says, if you understand the conventions of Hebrew poetry, and if you're not paranoid, you can appreciate that there may have been nothing deliberately sinister in the women's song. They were linking Saul and David together in this victory. The convention of putting a number in the first line and beefing it up in the second line was normal Hebrew poetic style. It was as if they were to say more prosaically, Saul and David have struck down their thousands and ten thousands of men, and they did mention Saul first. These two heroes should be celebrating this, this great victory and the follow-on ticker tape parade joyfully together, right? I mean, things are good in the kingdom, or are they? Let's look at Saul's reaction now as we get a much deeper look into his heart's point of view. Saul was furious and resented this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but only credited me with thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? Obviously, Saul was not a student of Hebrew poetry, or he's paranoid, or likely both. In his mind, this song exalted David over him. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us just how much Saul understood about God's purpose for David at this point, but I do think it's safe to assume that Saul still remembered the prophet Samuel's words at Gilgal when, when first he told him how foolish he'd been to deliberately disobey God, and then he went on to say, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, <clears throat> But now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not done what the Lord commanded. So when Saul began to see why this young man had come into prom uh, prominence in Israel, Possibly. But now we see the stark contrast between Saul's heart and his son Jonathan's heart. And that difference couldn't be greater. Verse 9 tells us how Saul handled David's popularity. So Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. <clears throat> now, if you think about the contrast of hearts between Saul and Jonathan. We would expect to see jealousy 
from Jonathan. David was really taking his place as rightful heir to the throne. But that wasn't the case. Instead, jealousy shows up big time from his father. So, is that a problem? Those of you that know the story, you're shaking your head. Yeah, yes, it's a problem because all is not well in Saul's heart. As these events unfold, they trigger memories of the prophet Samuel's prophetic words at Gilgal. What God had said would happen is happening. And at this point, once again, Saul could have turned to God and asked him to overcome his rage, his jealousy. He obviously realizes that God's involved in the events taking place, that God is fully present. But instead, he returns back to his old MO, his usual MO, his usual way of doing things and taking matters into his own hands. <clears throat> And maybe we need to address the question, what's so bad about jealousy? Well, it has a serious effect on all of our relationships. Not just our family, our friends, our co-workers, but with God also. Stop and think about jealousy for just a minute. We grow jealous because we believe someone is taking our place. They have, they have something we lack that puts them in a position to replace us in our relationship, uh, in a job, uh, maybe our popularity or our position of influence. And we have examples in the Bible. Let's look at some of those. We know Cain was jealous of his brother Abel. Esau was jealous of Jacob receiving his firstborn's birthright. Joseph's brothers were jealous of little bro's relationship with their dad. It's not a lot of brotherly love going on in these examples, are there? Maybe this is just a problem with brothers. Sisters, does this not take place? <laughs> okay. I guess it does, huh? Well, here we see that Saul is jealous of David's rapidly growing popularity. His suspicions tell him that David is indeed the one that God has sent to replace him. In his heart, this is God's fault, which should prompt a warning for all of us. Our jealousy often leads to disobedience toward God. In each of those biblical accounts I just mentioned, the person or persons that displayed jealousy were all disobedient to God. They may be wondering, God, if you are sovereign, why haven't you taken care of me like you have them? If you had, I would be in a much better place right now. They want God to change His sovereign, holy ways so that they don't have to change their own disobedient ways. Which takes us back to Saul. God's desire was for him to repent. To stop focusing on himself and turn back to him. And you know what? He's given him plenty of opportunities to do so. But Saul continues to react in ungodly ways. His heart is fully exposed. And as a consequence, he's revealing some of the emotions displayed by jealousy. Now, so far with Saul, we've seen two. And our jealousy is often revealed... In the two ways we've already seen, in our anger and suspicion. Remember, we've seen anger with him in verse 8, after the women sing their cute little song of victory. And his suspicion, or paranoia, 
when he begins jealously watching David in verse 9 from that day forward. Now our jealousy can also be revealed through hatred and intent to harm. And that is exactly the kind of irrational behavior we find in verses 10 through 15 from Saul's jealous anger. Let's pick it up now in verse 10. The next day, an evil spirit sent from God came powerfully on Saul, and he began to rave inside the palace. David was playing the liar as usual, but Saul was holding a spear, and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him twice. While David's playing the liar to comfort Saul, Saul retaliates by throwing spears at him. Not once, but twice. You know, one time you might say, ooh, whoops, sorry David, that one slipped. But twice, now looks pretty intentional at this point. Did David play some bad notes? Not sure. Maybe, maybe David started playing that cute little ditty that the ladies have been singing during the parade. We're not sure. Scripture doesn't tell us. But now we read how our jealousy is often revealed by fear and dread. <clears throat> Look at verse 12. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had left Saul. Therefore, Saul sent David away from him. Do you see his irrational behavior? First, he wants to keep him close by so he can keep an eye on him. Now he wants to send him away, all for the same reasons. He's just, he's just not acting right. Anyway, he sent David away from him, and he made him commander over a thousand men. David led the troops and continued to be successful in all his activities because the Lord was with him. When Saul observed that David was very successful, he dreaded him. That word dreaded there means great fear. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this is not the end of Saul's irrational behavior. He recognizes God's involvement in their, at best, strained relationship, but he still refuses to turn to him for help. So under the guise of giving David a possible promotion over a thousand men, he plots to get David killed. So first Saul promises his daughter in marriage, okay, this is part of the reward for defeating Goliath. But if Saul is to get rid of David, why reward him by letting him become his son-in-law? Well, it's because Saul had a devious plan. You see, it would be dangerous for Saul to pit himself directly against David or to take him on in public. So let's look here at verse 16 and 17 and see if it helps us understand Saul's devious plan or helps us understand his heart's point of view. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was leading their troops. Saul told David, here's my oldest daughter, Merib. I'll give her to you as a wife if, if you will be a warrior for me and fight the Lord's battles. But Saul was thinking, I don't need to raise a hand against him. Let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So then for whatever reason, I don't know if it was David's humble reluctance as just a shepherd boy, as a servant, or if it was a change of heart by Saul, but Merib ends up being given to another man. Then, then Saul gives David a second chance to become his son-in-law. Saul finds out that his daughter Michael loves David. And now he's going to try to use this to his advantage. So he sets up another trap for David, and it's designed to engage him in battle once again with the Philistine army. I just got to ask, doesn't it feel 
like Saul has more faith in the Philistine army than he does in his own sovereign God? I mean, has he so quickly forgotten the whole David and Goliath incident? All right, so here's the offer that Saul's servants present to David. All he has to do to get Michael's hand in marriage is bring Saul the foreskins of 100 Philistines. That's a big ouch for somebody, huh? Um, so what will David do? Well, we're going to skip down now to our final five verses, and we're going to see just how far Saul's jealousy-evoked emotions get him. So in verse 26, it says, When the servants reported these terms to David, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. Before the wedding day arrived, David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented them as full payment to the king to become his son-in-law. Okay, I got to stop for a second here. We have a young couple that's getting married Saturday over here with us. And um, don't get any ideas, okay, Nolan? Um, I got to wonder, if I'm trying to win the approval of my future father-in-law, and he wants me to do this, how would I present those to him? <clears throat> do I dry them out? Put them in a basket? Maybe put some pomegranates and figs in there? Maybe a few flowers in case, you know, there's still a little bit of a weird odor there or something? Do I pickle them and put them in a mason jar? Maybe multiple mason jars to make them easier to count. How would I do that? A necklace. You could freeze dry them, right? Put them in a necklace and give them to your potential future father-in-law. You know what? A crown. Oh, and now that might please a king, right? That might please a king. Okay, we don't know. Again, some details are missing, <laughs> maybe thankfully, um, or I don't, I don't know. Um, well, it worked because then Saul gave his daughter Michael to David as his wife. Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved him. Yet another thing that hasn't really gone his way. And he became even more afraid of David. As a result, Saul was David's enemy from then on. I think it's safe to say jealousy can ruin relationships. And what happens to David? Every time the Philistine commanders came out to fight, David was more successful than all of Saul's officers. So his name became well known. That's our story from 1 Samuel 18 this morning. So how can we avoid falling into the same jealousy-induced traps that Saul did? I want to wrap things up today with some personal application. I want to look at four ways to deal with jealousy. Number one, deal with the root problem. Saul's main problem was pride and hardness of heart. He was never remorseful for his earlier disobedience. So, if you're here today and you struggle with jealousy, do you, re do you really want to solve the problem? Or are you going to allow your own worldly point of view to drive you into irrational behaviors. And you might ask yourself a couple of questions. Am I being prideful? Is my heart growing hard? And if you don't like the answers to those questions, and you desire to change, then you need to do the second thing, and that's turn to God. Saul never asked God to change his heart. 
Instead, he actively fought against God's will for him. And you know, it takes wisdom. It takes wisdom to solve this kind of big problem in your life. And we should remember the words from John, James rather, 1.5, if we're struggling here. It says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. Turn to God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. God wasn't holding a grudge against Saul. He just wanted him to repent. And then it says, and it will be given to him. And as Christians, we also have the opportunity to reach out to God through his son, Jesus Christ. If your own heart is hard and you're seeking to change, a change, a wise prayer request would be, God, please soften my heart. Give me a heart like Jesus. Christ our Savior sent his indwelling spirit. So seek out his help to help you battle your jealousy. Saul missed plenty of opportunities. Please don't miss yours. Number three, seek help from others. Saul could have turned to somebody close to him, someone he loved, someone he trusted that was not struggling with jealousy. His own son, Jonathan, but he didn't. And we all need accountability from other Christians that we know, that we love, that we trust. Someone willing to share and ask the tough questions. And that's help that leads us to the kind of peace that we truly need. And James addresses that in chapter 5, verse 16, when he says, And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, Rule your hearts and be thankful. Now, none of those three steps are easy. And this next one, the last one, number four, doesn't get any easier. Number four, share your feelings of jealousy. Do this with the other person involved. David was not Saul's enemy. He had no intention of forcefully taking his throne from him. Yet Saul never made an effort to be honest with him. And I think we all understand that that others know what jealous feelings feel like, right? I mean, I think we've all experienced that to some degree. It's, It's a common struggle for mankind. And even though there are a few out there that might try and take advantage of our feelings or our honesty or, or maybe even our vulnerability, most people will, will be willing to help us overcome jealousy, <laughs> even if they happen to be the one that we're jealous of. So I want to close now uh, with some words of encouragement from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.13. But keep in mind, these words were addressed to Christians. He says, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for the reminder that temptations, the temptations that come our way in this world, that they really are nothing new. They are common to others. And you are faithful to put a personal limit on them and provide a way for us to be able to bear it, even when we're struggling with jealousy. May we learn to address our struggles honestly as we turn to you and ask for your wisdom. May we also seek accountability from other Christians that we know and trust. Brothers and sisters that will be open and frank with us. 
and utilize the indwelling Holy Spirit Jesus has sent us. I pray we don't miss out on our opportunities to do so. And we give thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.